Not too long ago, I made a video talking about the New Orleans Saints and how they were criminally underrated. Things were looking bleak after Sean Payton's retirement, Jameis coming off of injury, losing to Ron Armstead, but most importantly, being $71 million over the cap. But people weren't even putting them in their top eight in the NFC power rankings. I still thought there was a lot there on the team and they were being horribly underestimated. Now, since that video has been posted, the draft has happened where they had two first round picks and they made acquisitions in free agency including the honey badger Tyron Matthew and Jarvis Landry so in today's video I'm not gonna spend time covering the Saints as a whole you can check out my last video if you want to see that but today we're gonna be talking about Jarvis Tyran and some notable draft picks that they made and really key in on what they're gonna add to this already underrated but highly talented team we're gonna dig into some film so we can get a really good grasp of how they're gonna elevate this team and maybe not the most obvious ways. There's a lot to talk about, so let's get right into it. Now, I had a tough time figuring out where to start first because I really did love a lot of their moves. There is one I didn't love at all, but we're going to talk about that later. But let's start with one of my favorite draft picks in the entire draft, regardless of team. The Saints and Lions moved up in the draft to snag back-to-back -back wide receivers, who I believe to be the best two in the entire draft. Chris Olave is a super talented receiver and is going to be a godsend in Jameis's return to the field. To pair him with Jarvis Landry, who we'll talk about later, and Michael Thomas easily puts them in a tier of wide receiver groupings that is shared by very few other teams in the NFL. But let's take a look at some Chris Olave film to see exactly what he's going to bring to their offense. Now, part of the reason why I love this Chris Olave draft pick so much is because when I was watching Chris Olave film pre-draft, I said I want him to go to a big arm quarterback because not only does he run a sub 4-4, but he gets downfield in a hurry. And what I mean by that is perfectly illustrated in this play right here. Now in this play against Penn State, Chris Olave does run a sub 4-4, but he's also such a smooth glider. He's been coming into frame here very shortly. There he is working from the slot on the right side of the field. Penn State's dropping into a cover three. He's going to get past the hook defender, get up field, and then right here in one step. The safety in the middle of the field has his hip turned. He's still getting depth accounting for Chris Olave's speed because in cover three, the seams are going to be very weak, and that's a lot of the time what the offenses are going to attack. So he's trying to get over and account for that. But what Chris Chris Olave is going to do is he's going to cross his face, make him turn his hips, and he does this so effortlessly and all in one motion. And this is the corner on the backside that has the deep third, and it happens so fast that he's not even seeing Chris Olave as a threat right now. But little does he know, in just a couple of steps, he is going to be absolutely burned for a touchdown. And we see that right here, just boom, one step. He's so fast and such a smooth glider that he can make double moves down the field and just get so deep in a hurry. And this is going to be a godsend for Jameis Winston. And if you just watch his highlights, you'll see him wide open down the field all the time. It's not because Big Ten defenses are bad, but watching this full speed, you can just see how quickly he can capitalize on a defense not being in great position. The next reason I love this pick so much is because Michael Thomas, Chris Olave, and Jarvis Landry can all play on the inside or outside. And right now we have Chris Olave in the slot. This is why I liked him better than Garrett Wilson because of how quickly he can win off the line. It's very Devontae Smith-esque. How fast are we talking about exactly? Well, about two steps into this route, this nickel corner takes a false step right here, and it might not be so obvious, but the rep is already lost because just five yards down the field, Chris Olave is able to stack him, and it's just off to the races, and there's not really going to be anyone that can catch him. But with an underthrown ball, he can still go ahead, and he made a habit of making these really tough circus-like contested catches. But he's also much more than a smooth gliding deep threat. He's also a very creative route runner. If you watched my George Pickens video, you saw a very similar route, but this is probably even more advanced. As he's faking the fade route right here, the corner thinks it's going to be a jump ball. He's getting ready in preparation for it, and boom, on a snap of a dime, Chris Olave snaps this route off and creates enough separation in tight spaces to win in the red zone. This is going to be huge when Jarvis, Michael Thomas, and Chris Olave can all win their one-on-one -on -one matchups, including their run game with Alvin Kamara, barring he's able to play this season. 
And this is why I really think he's going to be such a great addition and Jameis Winston is going to love him because he just absolutely plucks the ball out of the air. He has some of the best hands that just sticks right to him. He made a habit of going over the top, making these contested catches and over the middle of the field where this would be an interception. I mean, wait, let's go back real fast. Let's just look at this. Look at where this ball placement is. Look how, I mean, his shins are where the corner's head's at right now. He elevates, he saves an interception and comes down with it. And as a deep threat, he tracks the ball really well over both shoulders and can just make out flat out circus catches when he needs to. Now moving on to my next favorite addition to the Saints team, we have the Honey Badger coming back to his hometown city. Now football is a team sport, there's no doubt, but there are very few people or positions that can completely make a game changing impact to the respective side of the ball outside of quarterback of course. The Honey Badger is absolutely one of those people. Look what happened to the Kansas City Chiefs defense when he got there. He's the difference between a good defense and a defense that can win you a Super Bowl. He's only one of 11 so he can only do so much, but the vocal leadership, the energy, and the daily operations on the practice field in the meeting rooms makes everyone around him better. So we are going to look at some film of this game to see what he's going to add to an already loaded Saints defense that has guys like Marshawn Lattimore and Cameron Jordan, but what his biggest impact really cannot be shown on film. And this is huge when considering playoff success and team chemistry, but let's look at his actual game to show what he can still do. And if you've watched the Kansas City Chiefs games, there's a reason that he always seems to be around the ball. He's a very smart defender, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of what that means. So on the snap of the ball, just watch what he does. He's going to be coming on the splits right here on a third down. So watch the Honey Badger coming down the splits, but also watch the running back. He sees out of his peripherals him coming out of the backfield. He's going to take the wide angle. He's going to be a free rusher, but right here, he sees Jalen Hurts getting ready to unload the throw. He knows he's not going to be able to get to him in time, so he really flattens out his angle to in pursuit to get in the middle of the passing lane, get a hand on it, and cause the pass breakup. This is just smart football right here, making a play when there is no play to be made. He can't get after the quarterback right now. He sees he's about to throw it, so he flattens out. He he knows where the running back's going to be, gets a hand on it, disrupts the play. Here's the Honey Badger on this play. This receiver came up in motion, is going to take it up the sideline, and this tight end is going to be spilling into the flats right here. Honey Badger is responsible for this guy, but just again, being a smart football player, but we're going to see his athletic ability to close the gap in a hurry because he has his eyes on the quarterback. He knows where his man's at. He's not going to get beat deep. And as soon as he sees Taylor Heineke start to unload and get it to this tight end in the flats, there's a 10-yard separation between them right now. Right now, the ball's released 10 yards between them and Football being a game of inches, he creates yards of difference when he's out there on the field. Just watch the burst he has from putting his back foot in the ground right here to boom, attacking up the field, causing this to only a two yard gain and laying a pop, sending the tight end 10 yards into the sidelines. And he's going to play over the top, he's going to play in the box, but he can also be this rat defender right in the middle of the field lurking. And this is just such a veteran move right here. Watch how he plays this because he knows he has his linebacker covering this zone right here. And so when he has the middle of the field, he's going to see Darren Waller coming on an in route, but watch how he plays this. So on the snap of the ball, he's going to almost torque his hips at like a 45 degree angle, knowingly that if Darren Waller crosses his face, he's going to be able to communicate to this linebacker right here that he's yours, he's passing him off into his zone but he keeps his hips squared off this way just in case Darren Waller does exactly what he wants to do and he's going to be in great position to when Darren Waller open releases turns the other way he's being able to break on it cause the pass break up force a punt and the last play we're going to look at, here's the Honey Badger, and the Buffalo Bills are going to be running an outside zone, and this tight end is tasked to do a lot. Even though he's much bigger than Tyron Matthew, this is a huge reach stop. He's going to have to take a bucket drop step, get to the outside of Tyron, and try and steal the edge right here so the running back can take it up the sidelines. But let's watch Tyron Matthew because he plays right into the tight end's hands, or does he? So the number one problem Buffalo's trying to solve is how do we get the edge here? And getting the edge makes it a lot easier when Tyron Matthews is gonna take an inside release trying to beat him. This makes the tight end's job really easy. But he's still fast, he's still athletic enough. We saw earlier that he had this burst to get on the inside, work his way back out, and make a huge tackle for loss in the backfield. So even though he has a huge size mismatch, yes, this answers the age-old question, gentlemen. Size does not matter, it's all about how you use it. 
Now lastly, but certainly not least, Jarvis Landry got picked up for literal pennies on the dollar compared to the current wide receiver market. Now we didn't have the production we're used to seeing from him, but similarly to the Honey Badger and his leadership sales, we got to see Jarvis on hard knocks and how much a leader Jarvis is going to be in that wide receiver room. But it also came out in contract negotiations that he was playing very hurt all last season, but still gave everything he had. And he was also getting the ball thrown to him by another very hurt team teammate. So I'm not concerned at all by the numbers because Juice still has a lot of juice in the tank. And he has been one of the premier slot receivers in the NFL since he's been in the league. We're not going to spend as much time on him, but he's definitely going to be a nice addition in the slot. And I'll also show you what he's going to add to the offense similarly to a Taysom Hill. And I don't have too much for you guys here with Jarvis Landry besides conceptually because a lot, if you watch his game, it's a lot of slant routes over the middle, quick out routes. He's just able to use his elite route running ability to create separation. He's never been a speedy guy. He ran like a 4.77 at his combine and he's in like year eight right now. So he's going to be a huge for that aspect of things. But we can still see on a play like this, he can still use his route running ability to beat nickel corners one on one, create a lot of separation and get the push the ball down the field. And I chose this play just to show that he's lined up as like an X receiver right here. He can still play on the outside. He's going to absolutely dust this corner on this double move right here just to show you that he can still win it one-on-one. -on -one. And as this play continues, you can see that he gets a really good ball from Baker Mayfield. Highly accurate. Not much he's going to be able to do right there. Hopefully, Jameis Winston will be able to put it between the numbers. So he can play the slot, he can play outside, but where is he on this play? Well, he's actually lined up behind the center right now because Jarvis Landry is actually a very good passer of the football. I'm going to throw up his stats right here. This isn't including last season, but so far he's 7 of 10 with 148 yards passing and 145 passer rating. So he's going to roll out to his left here as he is the lefty, but the play design on this play is to get the ball back to Baker on this throwback screen. And what we see a lot with these plays is receivers that aren't quarterbacks not really knowing what to do. They're just going to stick to the game plan. They're going to count to it. But what happens when it isn't there? What happens when the corner sits right on Baker and the throw isn't there? Well, like Taysom Hill, he doesn't panic. He steps up in the pocket and he's actually able to create with his legs and get in the end zone for the touchdown. And if we could see that with not so much lag, that would be amazing. But as we see this full speed, we can see him roll out to his life, look right back to Baker, doesn't see anything. He's still a very elite athlete and he's able to find the end zone. This is going to add so much variety when you have Taysom Hill playing that gadget role and you have Jarvis Landry getting end arounds that he did a lot for the Browns, but also being a threat to pass it down the field 50 plus yards. Now, after all of that, I did say there was one move I really didn't like, and hopefully I can be proven very wrong, but I hated the Trevor Penning pick. It seemed like a no-brainer to replace Teron Armstead, even though I didn't think James Hurst played bad at all when he had to step in. But Trevor Penning is an athletic freak who tested off the charts at the Combine. He's massive, incredibly strong, and quick. However, I think his technique is poor, and watching him play, he seems like a total head case. Turnovers will lose you games, but holding penalties and 15-yard personal fouls will stall drives dead in their tracks and lose you games as well. And he seems like a guy that will give you a couple of those in each game. He's so athletically dominant, but as a lineman, you have to find the balance of aggression, power, and finesse. You have to be technically sound. And when he played at a small FCS school, when he was beat by a way athletic dude that outplayed him technically, it looked that he took it personally and he was being dominant and his initial instinct was to hold, throw them to the ground, and lay on them to show them up. Football is an emotional sport, but this cannot happen at the highest level. And when the athletic gap closes when he gets to the NFL and the technical side of things opens up even more, I don't know if they can fix this mindset for him not to lose his shit whenever he loses his rep. This led him to have 16 holding penalties in only 12 games against far inferior competition. Now, I could be very wrong because his athletic potential is off the charts but if he doesn't fix this I could see this being a devastating first round pick when you're looking to compete for a Lombardi but with all of that being said the good far outweighs the bad since last time we talked about the Saints and I think this team should be 
feared in the NFC. And also, if you've made it to this point in the video, I did have a lot of questions why I haven't posted in a week when I had been posting four to six times a week for a very long time now. I appreciate you guys, first of all, for wondering. I went back home to Michigan for my mom's birthday and Mother's Day, and then I flew out to San Diego to walk for my graduation at San Diego State University. Jackson Edward Malone. And yes, that's my full name if any of you were curious at all where the J-E-M and Gem Live comes from, but I thought I would clear that up at the end of the video. But I'm back in Miami looking to get back on the grind because I missed making videos for you guys so much and don't look to stop anytime soon. But that's what I think about the Saints. I think they have so much potential and they absolutely killed the free agency and the draft process all around. But let me know what you guys think. Make sure to like this video if you like videos like these. Make sure to comment down below what you think about the Saints and make sure to subscribe if you enjoy daily sports content. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoy it. Thank you for checking out the channel and I will see you all tomorrow. Peace!